morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, so we, get, we are ready for a fish bowl. We're going to get started with the fish bowl. Uh, quickly explain how the fish bowl works. The idea with the fish bowl is we're going to have uh, the committers on the stage, uh, like we had last evening. But we have two additional chairs, which basically means that anyone from the audience can come up and take a chair. Uh, whenever you feel that you have a better answer or you have something more to contribute than what was already you know, spoken. So you can come up here, grab a chair, and you know, give your uh, two cents, add your two cents into this. Uh, the rule of the fishbowl is at any given point in time, one chair needs to be empty. So these guys, we put glues on their, st uh, on their chairs, so they're going to be stuck. They can't move. But between the two chairs, uh, we can have one person come up. And when the second person comes up, the first person will have to leave. So they keep one chair empty. Make sense? All right. So we have basically room for one person to come up. The second person can come up, and the first person can leave. So let's invite our committers on stage. We're missing Sandy. So that leaves more chairs <laughs> for people to come up. All right, do you guys want to say something before we get started? Good morning, everyone. <laughs> are we having a fun conference? <laughs> Who's not having a fun conference and needs a hug? <laughs> okay. So who has the first question for the day? Uh, one request is please keep your questions short. That will help answer more questions. Right? We'll go here and then there. OK, hello, everybody. So myself, Amit. So I have a question. Uh, there's an open bug in the bug list. Like, we cannot hook the Selenium code into an existing browser, which is open manual. So sometimes we face, while executing a very long transaction-based scenarios, where to debug that particular point, we need to, it takes around five minutes to reach there. So sometimes it would be easy if we can have this. So if not possible, just wanted to understand the restriction. So the reason that, the, the reason that we, that it's not po possible currently and is, is, is difficult to attach to a running browser instance is that the WebDriver library has to communicate with each browser somehow, right? Um, and that communication channel is usually some sort of a TCP port. Um, and the only way that the browser, you can instruct the browser to listen on that TCP port is to do it when you launch the browser. They're, 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 the browser by itself doesn't have the ability to just, hey, start listening on the TCP port when, I don't know, when you, when, when you flip a switch in the UI, it's just, there, there's no way to let it do that. So in the case of Firefox, we have to use a profile to do that. In the case of uh, Chrome, there's a command line switch that has to be added to Chrome or that the Chrome driver adds to Chrome to, to start listening on a port. Um, interestingly, Internet Explorer is a little different. There is a possibility that you could in theory, connect into an existing browser. Um, I have been reluctant to add something like that, specifically that's IE specific, uh, because I believe that you know our API should continue is and should continue to to be cross-platform. So there is, however, a really easy way to solve this problem, which is to not solve it. Um, if you put the lifecycle of the browser under the control of Selenium, like if you start the, the, the browser that you're going to use for the manual section with WebDriver, then you already have that connection up and running. And when you hit the end and it's like, ah, now I need to be able to poke around in the browser and control it, because you've already started a browser session, you'll be able to do that. Um, if you're using the Selenium server or something like that, you could probably use like Python to give you a REPL or even Ruby, right? So. Um, 
you don't need to code everything up. You can have like a completely interactive session. And that might actually save you a lot of time and effort. And you could do it today, and it would work for all browsers. That'd be great. Thank you so much. Namaste. This is Bharat. I represent a company called uh, Grey Locus. Uh, first of all, the reason why I came here is to make sure that I wanted to thank you people for having this Serenium project keep going. The reason is uh, just that the, re the reason why Grey Locus exists after two years of uh, is being founded. Get to your question. Yeah, I'm or getting to it. Yeah, the question is simple. You know, I wanted to know what, what is the plans about the HTML5 uh, related uh, API with respect to WebDriver? Uh, first of all, I'm really, really pleased to hear and very humbled by your comments. Thank you very much. Um, HTML5, that's a big beast, right? And it's composed of a number of different moving pieces. Um, like CSS3 probably hooks in there as well with the 3D transforms and the horror that that, that entails. Um, so let's break it down into the various bits and pieces. Uh, HTML5 is, a, is an evolution of the HTML standard. Um, it's presented in the browsers. It's still got the DOM. WebDriver will continue to work with those things. Um, the next thing we're probably going to come across is the fact that uh, it's got new form elements that people use. Um, we have, in the standard, had several discussions about how we're going to handle those, um, and we just need to write some just need to write some utility classes to make that work the way we want it to. Um, but effectively, each of the new HTML form elements has a sort of string serialization that it sends across the wire, and we will make it easy so that if you do a send keys with that string serialization, the correct thing will happen in the HTML5 uh, form element. Um, what else is, what else, do you want to come up here and just sort of talk to us about the things you want to see in HTML5? You don't have to, okay, that's a very wise man. Um, what, what other things in HTML5 would you like to see us support? So the, the form elements? Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, we have plans for supporting those in an, in an elegant way. But for now, it'll, it'll ultimately boil down to calling send keys. But we'll put wrapper classes around that to make it easier and nicer to use. Excellent. OK. So yes, HTML5, wonderful thing. We will support it. Yeah. <laughs> um, if I, relative to the HTML5, is it? You're talking about shadow DOMs, is it, is it a problem? But, um, but actually, uh, my question is, um, as for HTML, probably more like JavaScript, will there be a support for, we, we see now a single page application and more uh, stale uh, exceptions. People have to write their own code, it retries, the, the page factory uh, isn't, isn't uh, perfect for every solution right now. Uh, so, will there be focus on that topic? And the second question is something already, we already been asking the Selenium Hangout, but the, that was a discussion. So, it's about the the image uh, capturing that I know everybody's uh, picking on you uh, because it's not your fault. <laughs> but uh, but it, it's kind of okay. There's a standard. There's a, you, you decide on the standard, but. Every browser takes different screenshots, some on the viewport, some full canvas. Uh, um, and will there, at home, uh, until home, uh, home library number two, it did work full screen and now it doesn't. Yeah, I know everybody keep, keeps complaining and you can see that it's almost like the HTTP response. Okay. Uh, that's it, so. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the first question is around stale element exception. Sit the pun? Single page applications. Yeah. Single page applications and the stale element exception. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting, right? I mean, I've worked on projects where we've kept the, the chain all the way back in a, in a web element, and um, if, if we fail to interact with something, we'd like do one lookup. 
that always upsets me a little bit because it means that I've lost control of my application. Like, I have no idea really what's going on. Um, until something like React came out, I think that was a perfectly reasonable position to have. I, I mean, I'm a curmudgeon, right? So it's a curmudgeonly reasonable position to have. Um, but nowadays, it's, it's getting increasingly difficult to tell when the underlying DOM has changed. I don't know is the answer. If we do do something, it'll be done on the local end. So it'll be like, hey, I tried to interact with it, and now well, I failed, and so here's some retry logic or whatever it is. Which is fairly easy to write. Like, none of it's too complicated. Um, and so I'm loath to, to do something like that, because every time I put something in the library, people start leaning on it, and they start going like, ah, and like I go like, here's an example of how things do. Like, um, the expected conditions I put in there is like, hey, here's a sample of like how you would use the weight. And people are going, well, there isn't an expected condition for the thing that I want. And so here's a patch that gives it to you. And like expected condition is now like a big, bajillion things long, right? And it's like, it was just meant to be an example to show you what you could do for yourself. But maybe, I mean, it is something that comes up frequently. Um, Santi, did you want to add anything about stale element exceptions? No, I think I'm good. I was just <laughs> wondering, uh, when you tried this lookup after failure, did things just work? Was it a no. good solution? <laughs> it, it alleviated some of the pain, but it didn't work consistently, right? And, and that's because, actually, you'd lost control of the page. You didn't really know what was going on. And the better thing to do was to go like, okay, I'm now going to use an explicit weight. I'm going to look for that element again. And away we go. And the reason why we were doing that is because we performed some interaction on the page that had caused the page to be updated using JavaScript. And people normally think of like using the expected conditions, the, the, the explicit weights, when you do a full page reload. But really, it's like, I've done something that I expect to cause the DOM to mutate. That mutation doesn't happen in real time. You've got a race condition going on. So it's always best to like cause a mutation to happen, wait for it to be done, then continue moving. OK, so, okay, so I'm going to say something, and then I'm going to see Simon throwing things at me until he throws me off the stage. Uh, but uh, the way I went around solving that was to basically wrap every action into uh, uh, implicit weight for the uh, uh, for Ajax to finish and for the animations to finish. And that way, if you have a form that you're filling out, uh, the um, typing action is sets the text and then waits for everything to finish loading and only then proceeds. So having those implicit weights. And then the second thing is to um, not have a reference to any element in memory and look it up every single time you are trying to interact with them, everything. So start basically from beginning, and that way you get the fresh element every single time. But again, it's not a pretty solution. That reminds of Selenium 1 with the locator, yeah. concatenation. Yeah. The, the first idea I've applied in a similar way, without implicit weights, but by putting like um, application-specific wrappers around form elements. So I've like created my own text field, for example, which is aware of the fact that hey, look, there's some validation that goes on, or there's some JavaScript that gets done, or like it autocorrects my spelling of whatever word it is. Um, second idea, will murder your speed. Particularly if you're using a, a service such as Source, where you're not running on your local host, but you've got like the entire internet three times between you and each request you make. So you sort of go from your local machine out to Source Labs, then the browser does something, comes back and then comes back to you. Oh, four times. You, 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 you know, put it, the speed of light is fast. But if every single request you make is an RPC and you're, you've got like two times the internet between you and, and, and getting that response, it's going to murder your performance, right? So I probably would not not hold a reference to an element, but I would have custom wrappers around classes. So you're only halfway thrown off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> um, hey, Simon. Um, so my name is Krishnan. I come from PayPal. So I have two questions around the event firing web driver. So one, um, the Java bindings. So why does the event firing web driver use a proxy pattern in order to, you know, many instances? It was demo code. It was like here's how you could use, here's how you could track everything that web driver does. Okay. And so the proxy, uh, the, the, the dynamic proxies is how you do that in Java. Okay. So the second question is, 
why doesn't even firing web driver support the actions class? As uh -huh. in, uh, like, you know, I mean, whenever I use the even firing web driver and do some, I mean, uh, some find element or some click and all of that, all of the hooks get called on. But every time I do something using the actions class, nothing happens. I've been trying to find this one for a couple of days, I mean, a couple of months now. I mean, I haven't been able to figure it out. So I thought I'll probably ask you, yeah, it's probably going through a method that we haven't proxied. Like, we, we proxy several things, but we don't have hooks for, like, on X for every single method. And it's probable that, um, that we just missed it. Because, like, the, the event firing web driver was a case of, like, someone coming up to me going, like, I don't know how to log all the things that are happening in it. And it's like, well, this is ridiculously easy. And they're going, I still don't know how to do it. And so it's like, you could do it at the command executor level, they go, ah, oh, that's two level level. And it's like, well, he, he, here's how you would do it with a dynamic proxy. And it was like useful code, but it's pretty old, right? It's about, it predates the actions API, and so it's not there. If you send me a pull request, I will pull it in, um, and then it will be available for everyone. So check out the code, send me a pull request. That I will definitely it. do. I mean, yesterday after you said that, you know, you're gonna be, needing some help with the documentation for, for the part. I thought, you know, the easy way for me to come up and sit, on, sit along with you guys is probably send you half a dozen pull requests on documentation. Would love that. That would be awesome. In the genuine sense of the phrase, awesome. You know, you're welcome to come up here, guys, if you want to have, like, a conversation with us and uh, kick things off. Like, there could be something really controversial. I don't know. Have we got the API right? Does the WebDriver API feel good, or would you prefer the old Selenium one? Would you prefer Watkins one? Mm. Would you? Oh, I don't know. What would be exciting? Proxy handling. Have we got that right? Okay. Uh, assuming Sandy assuming has, no one wants to. Sandy has questions about that. No, I'm kidding. Do you, you want to? No. Okay. Okay. I guess we'll take another question from the floor if no one wants to come up. We very seldom bite. Uh, hi everyone. Hi. My name is Santo. I have a quick question. So the file upload on the Selenium, I mean, Safari browser is not working. So the weird thing is uh, if I run a JavaScript code to click on that input type file from the control of the uh, Safari, it works. The same code when I try to run from the JavaScript executor of the Selenium library, it doesn't work. And the only way we are doing right now is using uh, Apple script. So if you go via Apple script, then uh, parallel mode can't be done. So we are uh, slapped. So I need an uh, answer. It's a question, why is the Safari driver not that good? Or, I mean, I mean in the why, politest possible way. Yeah, I mean, the main question is why it can't able to click on the uh, input which of type file? So Through that, JavaScript. Uh, right, yeah. Yes. So, all right, Jim, go for it. So to answer that question, you kind of have to understand a little bit about how the Safari driver is built and, and, what it, and how it works. The Safari driver is uh, a JavaScript, mainly a JavaScript implementation. And in JavaScript, when you call a method or a, a JavaScript function that brings up a modal dialog on the UI thread, the JavaScript uh, thread, the JavaScript execution is blocked. And so for uploading a file, that is exactly the case that that describes. You call a JavaScript function that then brings up a modal dialog on the UI thread, that is the file selection dialog, and the JavaScript is blocked until that dialog is dismissed. It's the same reason that the, that the Safari driver doesn't support uh, alerts, uh, the, the alerts API, is because we don't have a good way right now to, um, to not block the the uh, the um, uh, the JavaScript thread when the when the uh, the modal dialog is presented on the UI thread. It's it, it it just is a limitation of the way JavaScript works in modern browsers. Other other drivers don't have this problem because they're not JavaScript implementations inside the um, the, the the running UI thread like the like the Safari driver is. And Safari driver is unique in that respect. Yeah, the Safari driver is basically a hack, right? We, we, we needed Safari support. Everyone needs Safari support. Um, but it's very similar to like the original Chrome driver, which was like, it runs as an extension in the browser. 
but it doesn't have access to the internals of the browser. It can't do um, insecure operations and things like that. It, it's limited by the extensions API that Apple offer. The real nice thing that would happen is if Apple were to step up to the plate and do their own implementation. And I think for them to do that, we need to finish the specification. I think that's, that's the thing that would help Apple move forward. So yeah, we should get on with that spec at some point. That's what we should. Thank you. I expect we should. I expect we should. <sighs> So, do we, do the, the, we the question, a, by the way, the question for, for those uh, who may be watching this later was, do we have a relationship with the Safari team? Do we know anybody there, uh, is the question. So, the, the cult, the, we run into the culture of companies, right? Um, talking to Google, Google has a very open culture, so does Mozilla, um, where people are willing and able to communicate and participate in open source. Um, Microsoft have... Um, over the years become more and more open um, and they're able, they, they come to the face-to-face -face meetings, they discuss things with us, they, they are writing their own implementation, which is brilliant. Um, but they have a corporate culture that is concerned about open source for reasons that they're worried about, you know, have it, if, if some of it gets in and the viral nature of the GPL, what happens to their, to their crown jewels? And so they're quite sensibly protecting things in the best way that they, that they believe is, is possible. The corporate culture at Apple is, um, is a more closed one, right? I mean, you know, Apple famously don't really leak very well. They're, they were a company that leaked from the top, right? It would be like Steve Jobs back in the day going like, ah, oh, by the way, we've got this amazing, oh, crikey, I shouldn't have said that, right? The lower levels in, the engineering levels in Apple are incredibly disciplined about maintaining um, the strictures that they have with their, their corporate NDAs. Um, so, we, we talk to the Apple team. We obviously, you know, I run into members of them, David does. We've, we communicate with them, but the culture of the company isn't one where they will come out and say to us, oh, by the way, we're doing this. Um, we are following the steps that we are meant to do in order to, to do the right things. So like David Burns has filed a, an issue on the, um, the WebKit radar, going like, could we please have WebDriver support? And like that, that's, the end of the public face of Apple, right? It's just the way the company is. I'm, I'm not saying anything good or bad about them. I just think that's the way their company works. Um, my expectation is that Apple are a company that do a good job with standards implementation. Like Safari knocked it out of the park when it came out, right? It was like Opera had a fantastic standards implementation and then WebKit came out and just also did a really excellent job. Um, and you know, they're, they're Unix compliant in OS 10 and things like that. So they understand standards and the importance of it. And my expectation and hope is that when we get the standard out, the specification, then there's going to be that concrete thing which allows Apple to participate in the browser automation community um, in a way that currently I don't think we've enabled them to do. Yeah, and yeah, for those of you not listening, that provides context for how important the spec is. Did anyone up here want to add anything to that? Okay. Hi, my name is uh, Takesh. I'm from uh, EMC. I just have a small uh, question. Uh, this question is to Simon. Uh, can you uh, share little details about the Selenium landscape in uh, Facebook? What kind of tests do you run? How many tests do you run to keep us happy? I don't know the numbers off the top of my head. Um, it, rather interestingly, at Facebook, which is a company I work at as a software engineer, um, I work on our build tool instead of uh, browser automation. Like, I arrived, the first project I worked on was helping set up some of the end-to-end -end testing for mobile for Android for iOS. Um, I rolled off that project about a year, 14 months after I joined, and I'm now working full-time on the build tool team. Um, the build tool, by the way, is Buck, B-U-C-K. It's open source, it's on GitHub. It's like a next generation build tool. If you build any Java, take a look at it. It's blazing fast. Um, I'll stop advertising things now. Uh, my second question is, uh, uh, we all face so many challenges day in day out working with Selenium. Do you people at least have one challenge working with Selenium? One, one challenge in, in implementing Selenium? Yeah. I think 
So I'll pass the microphone down because I think we can all answer this one, right? For me, Paul Hammond had it right when he called me insane when I started down the path of tightly integrating with the browser instead of doing the JavaScript thing that Selenium RC, Selenium Core did. Um, and he was entirely and completely correct that it was an absolutely bonkers thing to, do, to have done. And if I'd realized how hard it was, I wouldn't have started. But I was young and foolish and did it anyway. Big challenge. Um, that was the original C++ code, if you didn't hear what Simon said. That was a challenge. Um, um, I think, for me, probably the, the biggest challenge was not a technical one for me. The biggest challenge was simply um, was social on my part, just getting over the, the hump of thinking, wow, can I really do this? Am I, am I able, do I have the ability to, to, to do the things that needed to be done in the project? Uh, and, you know, I, that, that to me is, is something that I think uh, that is, uh, was, was a real challenge for me to overcome, to just dig in and do it and start. And if I wasn't up to it, then I wasn't up to it. And that was, that was probably my biggest challenge. I think for me would be how extensive the code base is. It's actually, it's definitely challenging. Every once in a while you get, you have to get reminded of the structure and where things are, the fact that there are, what, six clients, seven clients. Every code change you want to do, you have to apply it. If you go on the client side to seven clients, talk to seven people who own them, yeah. and push them through a huge, immense crowd of people who will be testing them. So it's a, it's a big challenge for sure. Uh, wow. Uh, for me, it's uh, pretty much the same story every time you get on a new project that has a Selenium build inside of the build tool and the fact that Selenium build is always the last one to run and it is 90% red because there's one or two tests that constantly flake out for whatever reason. and so. It's easy to think about this as a technical problem. Oh, we need to stabilize the build. We need to put these Ajax things. We need to do this, this, this. But in fact, a uh, majority of the test stability seems to be a cultural problem where uh, the developers or the team, the QA team, whoever, does not really respect the Selenium build enough to actively maintain it. and so having to convince the whole team, hey guys, this is important, Let's, it's, it's a first class citizen in the build uh, queue, and um, one, once you move it up though, once, once it's no longer this last thing that runs that nobody cares about, and get it to run every single build, and then um, convince the team to help you out and root out all the little flakiness and everything. Uh, once you get to a point where it's 99% green, uh, it's, it, it takes a year or two to complete that cultural shift, but once that happens, it's quite an amazing uh, result where Selenium build fails and several developers just completely jump up and start to freak out like, whoa, whoa what did I do wrong? What did I ever do wrong? Instead of, eh, it's whatever. Yeah. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to hang on because this gentleman here has had the mic and has been trying to ask a question for like the last three or four people. And, uh, and so I'm going to stop you and say, and say, go ahead. So thanks, everyone, for being here. Uh, so my question is uh, two questions there. So first question is when I try to cast IE driver to event firing web driver, I get series of exceptions. Uh, I mean, is it a known issue or is it something related to my implementation? Uh, second question is, if you could add one feature to Selenium on one click, what it would be? So I'm sorry, your first question was when you try to cast? When I try to uh, cast IE driver uh -huh. to event firing web driver. To, so, oh, to event firing, okay, right, 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 okay. Um, because one, the, 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 the reason that doesn't work is because um, Whenever you try to cast something, right, it's, it's an is a relationship. So 
So you can think of it as IE, the Internet Explorer driver is a, an, an event firing web driver, and it's not, right? It is not one, so you can't do the direct cast. Uh, if, you want to inst if you want to use event firing web driver, then what you do is you take your Internet Explorer driver instance and you create the event firing web driver wrapper by, by you know, calling the constructor and passing in the driver instance. And that's, that's how event firing web driver is supposed to work. Um, the second question, one feature, uh, I guess we can all answer that. Um, if I had one feature that I could, that, that, that I could magically put in, uh, it would probably be, I would, I, would, I would magically add a way to get the operating system identifier of either the browser process or the browser window itself because all operating systems have the concept of some way to uniquely identify each window element or each window in its window manager uh, and each process that's running. Uh, and if I had the ability to get that, then that would open up a whole wealth of possibilities for companion projects to the Selenium project. Um, but, uh, but that is probably never going to happen. So that would be the one feature that, that I would add. Um, if I could add a magical feature that does not make any sense but would be useful, I think it would be uh, recording videos out of Selenium. Uh, I found it to be extremely useful when you have a failure to be able to see four frames a second or 12 frames a second exactly what happened in your application throughout the, test, um, throughout the execution. So that'd be mine. My friend, do I have a project for you? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, right, right, right now, uh, my biggest gripe and pain point is uh, trying to simulate hovers uh, in different browsers. And uh, part of the biggest, I, I personally believe that one of the biggest reasons that Internet Explorer 8 is so horribly unstable for my build right now is that we have to inject some JavaScript snippet into the DOM to simulate a hover. To the, and it's so complicated. So my feature would be to say, hey, there's this link element. I want to move the real mouse right on top of this element. And instead of simulating a hover, to actually have a hover, that would be awesome. That's already there. Whoops. <laughs> that was fast. Yeah, don't, we, we just did it. Well, <laughs> while, you were, while you were asking for it, we went ahead okay. and wrote it. Done. Um, I think the thing that I, I would want would be a really elegant API, like where you look at it and you go like, yeah, that's how it's meant to be. Um, and WebDriver started off like that. Like the API was really, really tiny, and it's grown a little bit. Web Element is still that way. Like. Um, the two areas where I'd really want that elegance right now where we don't have it is around simulating user interaction using the advanced user interactions, like the, the actions, you know, new actions and you pass on a driver, that stuff. That is inelegant and feels clunky and I don't know how to make it beautiful, right? And that would be nice. And then the other thing that's coming is like the HTML5 specification has a bunch of things like Shadow DOM, um, and like web workers and things like that, where it will be really nice to be able to interact with it. And I'm not sure how that API should feel either, right? And so it's, a, it's an aesthetic thing. And we did pretty well with the sort of, I think we did pretty well with the feel of the API to begin with. Um, and I'd like to continue that, and I'd like to sort of move that forward into like the next generation of APIs that are coming. And I don't know how to do it, so there's gonna be a little bit of fumbling as we figure it out. Yeah, this is Sai Kumar. When I worked with the Selenium RC, I used uh, one of uh, CSS selector like uh, div contains, div colon contains, especially while targeting IE, so to avoid expats. So I used to use this, especially uh, if my application is a X based application. So such format is not allowing in uh, WebDriver nowadays. So what is the constraint, uh, uh, like it is from HTML standards or it's in part of WebDriver? 
So let me see if I understand correctly. You're asking about the contains pseudo selector for CSS selectors? Yes. Okay, great. Um, that's not a standard CSS selector. It's not, it doesn't appear in any CSS standard that's put out by the W3C. Now, it's, made, it's been made very popular because jQuery, which has its own CSS selector engine written in JavaScript, it does the, 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 the standard, the CSS standard selectors, but it also adds some extra ones for convenience sake. One of those extra ones that it adds is contains. Now, in Selenium RC, um, I believe in some cases we used to inject the jQuery um, in, in Internet Explorer, we used to inject the, 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 the Sizzle CSS selector engine, which is jQuery CSS selector, which is called Sizzle. We would inject it into, because at the time, Internet Explorer didn't support CSS selectors, so we used it as a polyfill. And of course, that gave you the ability to use anything that the, that the jQuery library would let you use, including things that were not standard CSS. Now that Internet Explorer does have a native CSS selector engine, we always delegate down to the native CSS selector engine if it, if it exists, and so we rely on whatever that allows us to do, which means that for some versions of IE, some of the CSS3 selectors don't work, like nth of type doesn't work in some versions of IE because Internet Explorer doesn't support it um, in, in their CSS selector engine for that version. Uh, and contains doesn't in any browser because it's not a standard CSS selector. It's, it's simply one that was, that was implemented by the folks at, uh, who, who created jQuery. Fortunately, you can download Sizzle as a library and you can inject it onto a page yourself and then you can use Sizzle directly in a, in a locator, right? So although we don't ship it in, in, inside the browsers, you can grab hold of a copy and you can use it pretty easily. And there are examples on the web of like how to do that in a buy, for example. So you can just do buy sizzle or whatever it is and it will work the way you expect it to. Okay. Uh, I have a second question. Um, especially when I trigger a suit against IE. So somehow uh, uh, the connection is uh, you know, losing in between a you know, browser and uh, you know, uh, web driver. The session is, you know, it is getting expiring or it's somehow it's losing its connection. So what could be the cause, uh, 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 is there any workaround to get the control of again the browser either by launching, relaunching, etc. So it's losing, its, the driver is losing the connection to Internet Explorer, that's, that's what you're yeah, seeing. Somehow, yeah, so uh, my script is containing its execution but the browser is not responding. Oh. So is this an RC or in? Uh, in WebDriver. In WebDriver. Especially for IE. So, I can think of some reasons why that would be the case for Internet Explorer in particular. Um, I'm not sure what losing the connection actually means in, in, in this context, but um, I do know that uh, protected mode settings are a big, big uh, hiccup for Internet Explorer. The way the Internet Explorer driver works, um, this goes back to, to the, his, the history of when, Internet, when, when IE7 shipped and they, they introduced uh, user access control in, in Windows Vista. Um, one of the things that changed radically was that it, they introduced the, the notion of, protect, uh, of uh, Internet zones or, or um, security zones. Uh, and the, the, uh, the, uh, the concept of protected mode. When you're using the COM interfaces to drive Internet Explorer and you cross a protected mode boundary, so if you go into protected mode or out of protected mode, what happens is that if you're using COM to, do, to drive the browser, if you're using the COM interfaces to drive the browser, when you cross that protected mode boundary, the COM interface pointer goes away. I mean, it, it becomes orphaned because what IE does behind the scenes is it closes or it, it, it abandons the original browser, creates a new one to navigate to the new protected, within the new protected mode zone. It can't switch zones like that. You have to kill one and start another one. So that your COM uh, object pointer becomes orphaned. 
Um, we work around that problem in the IE driver by saying, don't ever cross a protected mode boundary. Okay? And we enforce that by saying that if that we look in the registry and look at your protected mode settings and see if they're set to the same, because if you set the protected mode settings the same for all of your zones, it doesn't matter what site you navigate to, you will always be either in or out of protected mode, depending on how you set them. And because that was a thing that was difficult to explain to people, we ended up, uh, and by we I mean I, had the browser throw an exception when it read the registry and say, your protected mode settings are different, right, for these zones. You need to set them all the same. Um, so we would throw an exception. But that introduced another layer of problems in that some people can't change the settings on their browser because they're locked down by their IT department for some unknown reason. It, it boggles the mind that the, the, the developer is not able to set the settings on their own machine. Um, but so we added a, a capability that bypasses the registry check for people in that instance, or in that, who are in that case, who can't change their protected mode settings, but still need to run the Internet Explorer driver. We tried really hard to make this capability in the language bindings scream out that this is something you should never use. The name in Java, it's in Java, the name of the capability is introduce flakiness by ignoring security zones. You're actually saying I'm going to introduce flakiness in my test. In, um, in the .NET bindings, the capability is introduce instability. I mean, we, we've actually tried to make it blatantly obvious, blazingly clear that you should never, tr you should never use this capability it, uh, unless you absolutely have to. And if you have to, realize that you're just asking for trouble to come with Internet Explorer. The right way to handle it is set your protected mode settings to the same for all zones. And that's, and, and, and that's just the only way that is truly supported for Internet Explorer. Um, there's one other case that might be, that we might have some challenges with sort of losing the connection to the, to the browser. Uh, and that was introduced by Internet Explorer 11. Uh, there, was some, there are some instances where the protected mode boundary can be crossed in, in, in IE 11 even if you have the protected mode settings set properly. And there's a registry key you can set to prevent that from happening. Uh, that's documented in our, on our wiki page for Internet Explorer for configuring IE, the IE driver. So um, that I, I, I hope that at least gives you some places to look. And, gives you, and, and I, I really want to make clear the background of you know, it seems arbitrary. Why should I have to mess with my protected mode settings? Well, there's a very good technical reason why, uh, and, and, and that's it. Because otherwise, we do lose the connection to the browser when you cross a protected mode boundary. Thank you. There's a gentleman at the back in a green top who had his hand up. Yes. If you're super shouty, I might be able to... Oh, have you got a microphone? No, okay, just shout. Okay, so to repeat the question, Chrome has an option in its developer console that allows you to emulate a, a mobile phone in Chrome. Um, would we expose that? And the second one was, is it safe to do uh, mobile testing using a desktop browser? First one, I'm not sure, I can't see why not, but it would be through a capability that you pass to the Chrome driver, and the Chromium team own the Chrome driver, right? This is. It's so one of the interesting and exciting and potentially frustrating things is that as browser vendors take ownership of their own drivers, we get less ability to go like, oh yeah, no, definitely, yeah, we'll do that. Um, on the other hand, the, the browser vendors 
really do want you to have an excellent experience automating on their browsers, and so they're, they're pulling their fingers out. They're doing an excellent job. Um, so if you file a task and ask, they may or may not do something, and you could do that on the, the Chrome driver project page. Um, second question, is it a good idea to test mobile on a desktop browser? It depends on the level of fidelity that you're after. Um, if it's a, does it render nicely in a screen this size? Sure, why not? Um, if it's, will this work in the browser on a device? I don't know. Like you might be, com you might be comfortable, you might be confident, you might be using like layers like GWT and, or jQuery or XJS, which paper over the cracks and give you a consistent experience between devices. And therefore, if it works in this size screen, it should be fine. Um, but then, you know, you, if, you, if you're using um, Chrome, you could probably spin up a, an x86 uh, Android emulator instance, enable the Chromium WebView stuff, and use the same Chrome driver to drive the WebView there. So you've given yourself an artificial constraint which doesn't need to be in place. Um, does someone else want to add something to that? Yeah. Um one of the things that would not be representative is going to be performance, right? You're going to be running on a full desktop environment with multiple cores and multiple gigabytes of RAM, and that will not be representative of a mobile device on a 3G connection with limited resources and battery power. So keep that in mind. Um, regarding exposing that, there the Chrome options are really extensive in those high capabilities, so you may be able to make it happen with things like flags to start Chrome. It depends on how the Chrome team exposed this feature, um, but you may be able to hack it with tools that already exist. Someone's coming up. Fantastic. Give them a round of applause. So yeah, just to answer your question, so actually I already did this thing. So usually in the developer toolbar, there are three options which Chrome gives, like to simulate the geolocations, uh, to simulate the screen size, the viewport size, and the third one is simulate the user agent. So I think these are the three things which like mimics a behavior of a mobile browser. Not the networking condition, but that you can also control through a proxy-like browser mob. So what we did, so in the Selenium, you can easily use the options to set the user agent to any user agent. So, and uh, you can also play around with the viewport size. You, we have a driver manage API, so you can change the screen size. So if, you, if your website is responsive, it will exactly looks like the way it looks like on a mobile browser. And the third for the simulating the geolocations, you can use profiles in Chrome. So yeah, so we are doing this, so it exactly the website looks like a mobile browser. So yeah, this way you can utilize the Selenium scripts to see whether your scripts work on a responsive UI which looks on a mobile browser. There's a, there's a service out there too that you could use. <laughs> yeah, can I go ahead? So I just had a quick, uh, it's, it's more of a query. So you know that uh, the mobile browsers are like, every month you have a new version of a mobile browser. So what would be your first thought when you know that, okay, a new version of a mobile a, a, a browser is coming up. I'm sorry, can you, could you repeat that? I, I'm yeah. not quite sure I understand the question. Yeah, so, so my question was like, there's a new version of uh, a browser that's coming up every month. Okay. So what would be your first thought when you know that another version of a browser is going to be launched? So you're asking what the, our approach is with uh, new versions of browsers that come up. You mean like, for example, a new version of Firefox that comes out every six weeks, yeah, or exactly. uh, a new version of Chrome that comes out, I guess they ship every six weeks, um, uh, and, and how, how, we approach, how we approach that, or how it, it, it would be uh, better for you yeah. to approach yeah, that? What would be your first thought when you know that a new version is coming up? What are our thoughts about that? Yeah. Um, well, in my case, uh, I, you know, I, I it, it's case by case basis as far as as far as uh, the, the 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 browser itself goes, depending on which which browser it is. Uh, for Chrome, I, I get less concerned 
about Chrome shipping a lot because it's really hard not to be on the most recent version of Chrome. You've got to go through some hoops in order to not have Chrome auto-update itself. So you're almost always running on the latest version. Um, Firefox, I, we have some challenges with Firefox because of the architecture of the Firefox driver and it requires a binary component that is based on the Gecko SDK that's tied uniquely to the version of Firefox that's being released. And so there are, challenge, there are challenges associated with that that we, um, that should be mitigated in, uh, largely when uh, you've heard people talk about Marionette over the course of the last couple of days, which is the next you know, Firefox driver that, uh, that uh, is owned by Mozilla, that's provided by Mozilla. That, uh, that would mitigate a lot of those pain points for us. Um, Internet Explorer has a pretty slow release cycle, so, you know, I mean, they, they don't update nearly as often, so I don't see that as a real, uh, you know, there, there's, there's some scrambling to catch up, you know, and make sure things work with a newer version of, of, of the driver, but, of the browser, but uh, in the main, there aren't a whole lot of, uh, a whole lot of uh, uh, issues with that particular browser. Anybody else want to? Yeah, I was going to add, considering the speed of the release process, it would be great if browser vendors provided tooling uh, to actually be able to download or install programmatically their stuff. Uh, we have projects at Sauce Labs. It's our job to always give you the latest browsers. And it's a really, really complicated task to get the right installer and automatically install it in your virtual machines. It's been a lot of work to get that down, and I would love it if the vendors would actually provide this tooling for everyone to consume and not just have to hack it out in different parts. Um, okay, I noticed that the time has crept by, uh, or leapt by actually, to be more honest. I've, it's gone really fast for us up here. It's now about 10 o'clock, um, and I think the, uh, the session was meant to finish at 10. So um, we're going to be around for the rest of the day. Um, I guess you are as well. Yeah, excellent. You'll be able to come, ask us questions, um, talk to us. Uh, if there's something that we haven't managed to get to that you want to, then do come and have a chat. We're, we're lovely. Most of us are lovely people. Um, thank you very much for listening, guys. <laughs>